Fishers, it is good to be together on this first Sunday in December. We're so glad you're here in the room and also those of you joining us online today. When I open the dictionary and look at the word behold, it simply says to see, to observe, or to look at. And during this holiday season, our hope and our encouragement as a church that we all would look at Jesus that we would see him and truly behold him for all that he has done and all that he is. When it comes to the holidays, we all come from different circumstances and situations. But one thing that we all can hold in common, and this is our hope, this is our encouragement this season, that we all would fix our eyes on Jesus. Where do we see him working? What is he revealing? 
to you? What do you need to ask of him? We're so excited for these next few weeks as a church as we celebrate the coming of our Savior. So we're going to worship him through song. I invite you to stand. And let's lift up our praise. The one who is worthy, the king of all kings, the prince of peace, the Lord of lords, Jesus, the Messiah. Your love is boundless, beyond what I could dream, your grace. 
Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. together this morning during this uh, season, a song that we're going to be learning over these next few weeks. And of all the names of Jesus, we remember around this time of year that his name means Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So let's learn this song together. The hope of the world, Jesus, our Emmanuel. <laughs> the silence with glory in the highest the hope of all creation resting in his mother's arms a song on the horizon ringing through the heavens a long-awaited savior come to set the is free. Come to set the captives free. Come set us free. Come to set the captives free. 
Well, good morning, and I join Josh in greeting all of you uh, smiling, wonderful faces here this morning in person, and a special hello to those of you who are online as we start this first week end of December, looking toward the birth of Christ in a couple of weeks, and uh, uh, looking forward to celebrating that together. But first, just a couple of simple uh, reminders and opportunities for you. And actually, one of them is almost a, a no-brainer because most of you have the space in your life now and um, are involved in a small group one way, shape, or form. And the stories of how you are loved and cared for and you are, are used by God to love and care for others is just always amazing. But many of the groups wind down for Christmas and then kick back in again once you hit uh, January. And so, ladies, you can start registering for the January session, which there were slides up there, and you can check out at the info desk. Uh, the the on-site groups that meet here Tuesday nights and Wednesday mornings, men's and women's groups, you can plug into those. And then there are life groups that meet in homes, and if you're interested in being involved in one of those, head back out to the welcome desk, the info center there, or stop Nathaniel, our newest staff member. Um, all of them would be able to help you and steer you in that direction to experience that together. And then secondly, it's only a couple weeks away. We're going to celebrate Christmas together, <clears throat> excuse me, on Friday the 23rd at 6 p.m. and then on Christmas Eve itself the 24th, 3 4.30 and 6 p.m. Looking forward to celebrating with you. And for those of you who will be in town, in fact, I've, I've even heard of some people I haven't seen in a long time are going to be in town to visit their parents. It'll be fun to see everybody all dressed up and ready for Christmas. Well, growing up in the church I did as a kid, there was a tradition where the ushers would pass offering baskets down um, through the congregation. And those people who called that church home and were practicing the discipline of giving would give um, week to week. And then the ushers would collect them and they'd walk back to the front 
And they'd hold these baskets at the front and the pastor would then pray, giving thanks for what God had provided to each of us individually and then to us as a congregation. Well, with online giving and just the way things have changed, that's just different now. And we don't feel that and experience that, but it doesn't mean that we can't just take a moment and I want to say right now to say thank you, God, for providing to each of us in our own homes and then through the people here who call Grace Fisher's home. Thank you for consistently and faithfully giving. It is used by God to have an impact in many lives. Well, as we kind of look toward Christmas, we want to have a little fun because there's nothing like that. God created us to have some fun. So we're going to have uh, another awkward Christmas trivia uh, moment this morning. And this was, is wrapped around seven questions um, that we asked the Grace Fisher staff. So uh, tally your answers, one through seven. Use your phone or your fingers. The person who has the most points will, get a, will have a gift waiting for you at the info desk on the way out. And it may be hard because we don't know maybe every staff member well, but have fun and just guess. So here we go. Question number one, if I can get to the right page. As an awkward Christmas gift, whose husband received a pair of tennis shoes with pictures of cats printed all over them? Stephanie, Wendy, Mary, or Nikki's husband? And the answer is Stephanie's husband. <laughs> Stephanie's husband, Chris, I would love to talk to Chris, but they just had twins this past week. It was awesome. They're gorgeous. Yes, we're grateful for a couple of healthy people. Cute babies. Number two, continuing with the awkward gift theme, whose sister-in-law gave a Christmas sweatshirt with a stain on it due to her pre-wearing it prior to wrapping it and giving it as a gift? Was it me? Was it Nathaniel? Was it Wendy? Or was it Kevin? It was Wendy. <laughs> so there you go. Number three. Oh, this one's good. Whose Christmas experience has included a family gathering in Eastern Kentucky with multiple ex-wives showing up unannounced, along with unknown cousins and newly discovered siblings, plus shooting off illegal fireworks that Papa had confiscated through his years as the county sheriff? <laughs> that new sitcom will be starting this summer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> was it Josh, Terry, Steve, or Beth? It was Terry. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Which staff member said Elf was his favorite Christmas mu uh, movie? Was it Joey, Nathaniel, Jim, or Kevin? It was Kevin. <laughs> Kevin! I'm oh, sorry. Uh, number five, what percentage of the Grace Fisher staff surveyed considers <laughs> Die Hard a Christmas movie? And by the way, I'm disappointed at the number. And for three bonus points, who's never seen it? Was it 23%, 38%, 46%, or 62%? Or 38%. And Terry and Mary have never seen it. What's wrong with them? Number six, whose favorite Christmas song is I Celebrate the Day by Reliant K? If you know Reliant K, you probably have a social security number. Uh, sorry, a Medicare card with you. <laughs> They've been around. Was it Joey, Josh, Stephanie, or Nikki? It was Joey. <laughs> and lastly, whose least favorite Christmas song, least, is Don't Be Late, the, uh, is Christmas Don't Be Late, the, Christmas, the chipmunk song. Is it Jim, Beth, Wendy, or Steve? If you guessed, are the one and only Steve Waylu, you are right. And boy, that tell, I might want to play that this week at the office. Okay, so there were seven questions, ten possible points, because there were three bonus points. Who got all ten? Okay, good, nobody. Nine, eight, seven, six points, five points. How many did you get? Seven. The gift is out there for outside for you. A pre-Merry Christmas. Well, we want to hear from you, okay? So if you have an awkward or unusual Christmas story, tradition, or moment, please email us at that email address. 
We would love to hear from you. You can keep them anonymous, or in some cases, the names may make it even more fun to hear. It's up to you. But go ahead and do that. And um, uh, we have some plans in a few weeks for those stories. And uh, it's just fun to have a little bit of, you know, just some laughs together. And so, um, but even though it's around a ser uh, the wonderful news of the birth of Christ, it's fun to laugh and be together in community. And so to kick off this series, Awkward Christmas, um, and bring fresh meaning and insight to it, I, I think week after week we're going to see that as God opens up his word in different ways, looking at Christmas from a different lens, is our pastor, Kevin Roth. Come on, Kev. It's the most wonderful time of the year. At least that's according to the classic song by Andy Williams, which goes with the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you to be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And what we hope for and what we sing about, what we see in commercials and internet ads, often December and the Christmas season doesn't always deliver was reminded of this as a story developed last Black Friday. So last Friday, Susie and I were leaving the driveway and our neighbors, Steve and Dana, were heading out and we asked them where they were going and they were headed to go have this kind of idyllic moment, you know, going to the Christmas tree farm and cutting down the Christmas tree. And now you, live, you have to drive 45 minutes from Fishers to get to a Christmas tree farm and they drove out towards Lebanon they got there and probably half of Hamilton County was there before them because they said there was a line a half a mile long to get once you had your tree to check out. And since they'd already driven 45 minutes and their daughter Taylor, who is in the picture, had to get to work and they were going to have to drive 45 minutes back. Uh, back. Steve, I love this about Steve. Steve just staged the picture at the Christmas tree farm, got the picture, and then they drove to Lowe's and bought a Christmas tree. So that's, I'm sure it didn't hurt that the Christmas tree was cheaper at Lowe's for Steve, if you know Steve, so. Our Christmas realities are often messier than what we picture. And sometimes that's because of our situation. Sometimes it's because of dealing with family. And some of it, you know, some of it, I mean, I have to confess, I don't love just some of the things around Christmas. I don't love decorating. My number one job is not to be a Scrooge when my wife says, okay, it's time to get the stuff out. It's time to start to decorate. And in fact, when I saw the Heiningers uh, heading out to get their Christmas tree, I was dreading us having to go get ours. Um, I was going to have to flip a light switch, walk down 14 steps, pick up the tree, carry it upstairs, and plop it from the basement into our main room. Uh, my wife has made things really simple for me. Um, which, by the way, even sometimes gift wrapping, you know, you go to these stores and see these amazing gift wrapping, and my gift wrapping never looks like it does in the store, but... Um, in the Grace Fishers app for the sermon notes, at the end of it, there's a great Christmas uh, gift wrapping hack that I put in there, just a practical thing I threw in uh, for you this Christmas season. And while our Christmas experience uh, isn't always what we hope for, sometimes even the Christmas story itself isn't as perfect as we make it out. You know, when we think about that very first Christmas when Jesus was born, we often visualize a peaceful, quiet scene with shepherds and wise men, a new mother and father, and these little animals, you know, they're, they're gazing at the baby Jesus in an adoring fashion. You know, much like we see on either a Christmas card or a nativity scene. But the first Christmas was probably far from peaceful and serene. From the characters involved uh, surrounding Jesus' birth, we often have a perception that may not match up to what actually happened. The reality is a bit more complicated and even awkward. You have an arranged marriage of an unwed teenage mom with a probably significantly older fiance. It probably wasn't the idyllic barn scene. You know, I always picture this, you know, barn weddings are in right now. I picture this idyllic barn wedding venue setting for having the baby. But the truth is there's this whole debate about the stable, whether it was more like a cave or it was a back room, but it couldn't have been all that clean with the animals. There was no wise men. They do show up a little bit later, but 
I always wonder what Mary thought when these strange men just kind of wandered in to the birth, you know, she just had a baby and these, these strange men, these shepherds that she didn't know wandered in. I wonder if she looked at Joseph and thought, friends of yours, did you invite these guys? <laughs> and we're going to actually talk about them next week. And then the larger political situation was a mess. They lived in a land that was occupied by a foreign military force and they lived under the control of a crazy and murderous local dictator. And Rob's gonna look at that in week three. But even in spite of this difficult and these awkward circumstances, God worked. He worked in ways that we can't imagine, in ways that blow our mind when we really think about it. And so over the next few weeks, we're gonna explore the very first Christmas and see that Jesus' birth came to bring hope despite an awkward family tree an awkward family portrait, and some very difficult and even scandalous circumstances. And by exploring the Christmas story, we'll recognize that despite any and all awkwardness, the will of the Father was fulfilled when Jesus came to earth as a human being. Jesus came to redeem and empower us to share his love in the world no matter what. And that very first Christmas reminds us of that fact that God can accomplish extraordinary things in your life and mine, despite our family, our circumstances, our realities, or our present situation. And so we're going to dive into the story, and we're, this week we're going to take a look at Jesus' parents. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, there's Bibles in the seat in front of you. It's on page 849. Say welcome to our friends online, or if you're joining us later And we're going to be looking again at Luke chapter 1, and let me pray for us. Father God, I just pray again that you would speak to us this morning as we look at your word. I pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds as we read the story, uh, as we're reminded of what happened that very first Christmas. I pray that your spirit would just teach us and show us the things that each one of us needs to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we really don't have that much recorded about Jesus' birth. In fact, two of the Gospels are completely silent on what happened. um, And they record very little about Mary and Joseph. And, And part of that was because in the ancient world, you weren't considered a person until the age of 13. And so until you were 13, they pretty much thought that nothing significant uh, happened in your childhood. Now, there was one exception. If there was any signs around your birth, then they would typically take note of those. And so that's part of the reason that the Christmas star is captured in one of the Gospels and the wise men, because those were significant things that happened around Jesus' birth. But we're going to take a look, and we're going to meet Mary and Joseph, and look at the difficult situation, um, surprisingly difficult situation that they entered into. And I want to give acknowledgement to Pastor Tim Ayers, who's a teaching pastor at Grace Church, for sharing some of his background. And so let's start in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, as we hear the story from Mary's perspective. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary, She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Now the context for this story, this comes right after uh, a story about her aunt uh, Elizabeth who becomes pregnant. She'd been barren her whole life. And it was a story, this follows a story about her and the angel Gabriel had been sent to her uncle, uh, Zachariah, to make the announcement. And so when we read this, um, we read that the the messenger was the angel Gabriel. And uh, Gabriel was the one that was sent to make big and important announcement. And it says in Luke uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, that the angel, when he gave his credentials to Zechariah, he said, I am Gabriel, I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you the good news. And so I think we can assume that that was true, that uh, God had sent uh, the angel to Mary uh, to bring her this good news. Now, Mary's response uh, makes sense when you understand her station in life. It says, confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. 
Because you see, in her culture, Mary was a nobody. Uh, she was common at best because she lived in a culture where uh, young was uh, uh, in a, a culture, she was young in a culture that honored age. She was a woman in a culture that honored men. And she was poor in a culture that honored the rich. She lived in a small, insignificant town off the beaten path. Probably fewer than 500 people lived there, and it was not even a town that had a great reputation. In fact, one of Jesus' disciples, when he finds out that Jesus is from there, says, can anything good come from Nazareth? And so it's not surprising Mary's response to this angel coming to make this announcement. Now the angel continues on in verse 30, and he says, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son, and you'll name him Jesus. He'll be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the, th the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, the angel starts out by saying, don't be afraid, which is a typical response to an angel. Uh, it's typically, when we see this happen, it's an overpowering image. Um, uh, angels are, are very powerful beings, especially one that stands in God's presence. And then he says again, you found favor with God. I think it's important that he repeated it twice. And then he rem tells her that she's going to have a baby. And he says that this baby... Uh, is going to have the name Jesus, which in Hebrew means God saves. And he also goes on to make some other significant claims about this baby boy. He's going to be very great. He's going to be son of the Most High. God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he'll reign over Israel forever. And these words have the echoes of some of the ancient promises that were made to King David in his line. But Mary doesn't really react to the promises because she's really stuck on the first thing that the angel said, that she's going to conceive and give birth. And so her response is, is what we would kind of expect. She asks the angel, how can this happen? Because I'm a virgin. And even though they didn't understand about all the DNA and the biology of how babies came about, they understood the basics about how babies were made. And the language is pretty clear that Mary had never been with a man. In fact, you, sometimes you hear that this was a story that was invented later, but it was clear because it's recorded by two of the gospel writers, and the story was widely circulated in the early church. But Mayor, uh, the angel is prepared for this question, and he replies this way. He says, the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has been pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she's conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the, word of the, for the word of God will never fail. Clearly, Gabriel was ready for his question. So he describes to her what is going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to come over her. And the language here is pretty typical for when the Holy Spirit moves in our lives and enables us to do things that we can't do on our own. But this language of the power of the Most High overshadowing her, the language is reminiscent of what happened when Solomon dedicated the temple and the presence of the Lord filled the temple and the priests had to leave the temple. They couldn't commission it because the presence of the Lord was so strong. And again, he makes additional claims about the importance of this baby. He's going to be holy. He's going to be the son of God. And then for proof, he points to Mary's uh, aunt, Elizabeth. And then he says these words, the Lord, the word of the God will never fail. Now, the reality in Mary's world is that if she became pregnant, she was going to be damaged goods and nobody, nobody, including her family, would want to have anything to do with her. She'd bring on her family, her extended family, and anybody connected to her, including her fiancé and his family. And her defense that this was happened because of the Holy Spirit would likely have been a death sentence. And whether she knew it or not in that moment, the rumors 
and the questions about Jesus' birth would follow her throughout her entire life because gossip like that never goes away in a small town where everyone knows everyone else's business. So in light of all of those realities, Mary's response is really staggering. And she says this, I am the Lord's servant. May everything that you've said about me come true. And the angel left her. And I have this image of Mary simply opening her hands. She had this beautiful, humble spirit about her that she invited whatever the words that the angel spoke to her to come true in her life. And it's incredible contrast to the story that's right before her. Her uncle, Zechariah, who was older and wiser and was a priest. In fact, he was ministering the presence of God. And when the angel came and made the announcement to him, he had real questions. In fact, the angel struck him and he was silent until the birth of his son, John the Baptist. And in fact, a little bit later in the passage here, Mary breaks out in song as she encounters, uh, she goes to visit her aunt Elizabeth and she celebrates with her and she breaks out into song. And it's just this beautiful image of a young, humble teenage girl and her excitement and joy celebrating what God has done for her and the way that God has kept his promises to his people. Now, this three months when she goes off to visit her aunt was probably a gift because she was able to cherish the miracle that God had done inside of her and to celebrate and live in the good news without the shame of having to tell her parents and ultimately having her fiance find out that she was pregnant. But Mary's reality was more complicated than what we see in the nativity scene. And the same can be said for her fiance, Joseph. So if you'll flip back a little to page 799, we're gonna look at Matthew chapter one. Now this is a narrative from a very different perspective. Uh, there's no singing in this one. In fact, Joseph doesn't say a word. Um, it's practical and it's simple. And while we don't know a lot about Mary, we, even, we know even less about Joseph. But one of the first things we discover about Joseph uh, is we discover as we read this list of names, this genealogy that lead us to Joseph. And while they're only or mostly names to us, to the first readers, it would have been reminiscent of the stories and the people and of God's faithfulness throughout the ages. And it tells us that Joseph was in the line of kings. He had a kingly heritage. But we also know um, from actually one of the other gospels that even though he had a kingly heritage, Joseph was a simple man. In fact, Jesus is described as a carpenter. The, the way this word is translated uh, in Mark uh, chapter 6, verse 3, uh, we know that it means Jesus was actually kind of a uh, constructive craftsman. He was a manual laborer, probably with some skill. But he was a simple man, probably a stonemason or maybe worked on farming implements. But he was a simple man in contrast to this kingly heritage. And in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1, this is what we read. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she began pregnant through, through, um, through the Holy Spirit. And sorry, I've lost a page here. Uh, through the, whole, the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break off the engagement quietly. Now, engagement was different than what we typically think of today. It was a legal arrangement, and the ages of people involved were significantly different. In fact, Roman uh, law had declared that the legal minimum age for a girl to be married or to be engaged was 10, and the Jewish rabbis had declared that 12 was the minimum marrying age from girls. The reality is that most girls were engaged by 11 and married off by the time they were age 13. In fact, a girl that was still in her parents' home after the age of 13 was considered a liability. The arrangements were made by the fathers. The, the two parties involved uh, weren't necessarily involved. Boys had to be at least 14 to marry, but most of the time they were closer to the age of 30 when they were married. 
Now, many scholars believe that Joseph was actually somewhat older, that maybe he lost his first wife, that he had a number of children to raise, and marrying Mary was primarily to have someone to help care for his children. Now, generally, most couples never met uh, until after this deal was done, and even then, when they were engaged, they only spent a little bit of time together with other family members present. So their first real meeting was on their wedding day. That was the first time they had any space alone. Now, we don't know what Joseph was told about, or when Joseph was told about Mary's pregnancy or how he found out, but we do know because it was a legal agreement uh, that he had the legal right to divorce her publicly and distance himself from the shame that would come upon her. But Joseph's response speaks to his character because the Greek literally says, now Joseph being just, and this phrase being just, it means that someone is known to have a life that continually reflects all that God expects of his people. And this is a huge positive statement about Joseph's character. And then we continue on in Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 20. As he considered this, as he considered divorcing Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in, the, in a dream. Joseph, son of Mary, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you're to name him Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. Now, this is Joseph's first dream of four. He has multiple dreams. And I love that the angel in the dream reminds him of his identity, his identity as a son of David, his kingly identity. And then he tells him not to be afraid. And this is a different to not be afraid than what the angel said to Mary because the angel was standing in Mary's presence. But for Joseph, the fear was all about what was going to happen to him if he went through with this marriage to Mary. Because he was going to have to live with all the questions, the rumors, and all the things that came along with marrying her. And this is where he hears that what her pregnancy was conceived by the Holy Spirit, or if it wasn't the first time he'd heard it, it was at least the first time that he believed it. And when the angel tells him that you are to name him Jesus, this is actually a command in their culture to take Jesus as his own, to adopt him, to claim him. And I love this footnote that the, uh, the writer adds when he says, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message about his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, with me, which means God with us. And it's a reminder of a prophecy from Isaiah, not one that was originally connected with the birth of the Messiah, but Matthew sees in this miraculous birth of Mary God's provision and reminder that God would be with us in challenging situations and challenging circumstances. And so Joseph, when he wakes up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife, and he didn't have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named, named him Jesus. So G Joseph does what the angel commanded. He took Mary into his home. Uh, he protected her, and he took on his shame. He named the boy Jesus and claimed him as his own. And I'm sure this wasn't the marriage that Joseph had anticipated, and I'm sure it wasn't in the way that he imagined, but he trusted God's promises and God's words in the midst of situation and circumstances that were, I'm sure, a mix of confusing and scary. And this week, I got some incredible perspective from a little devotional from Christianity Today when the writer highlights what Joseph experienced, and this is what the writer said. For Joseph, assigning this name was more than following the angel's order. It was a declaration. The man who says nothing speaks loudly here. In his helplessness, when his world went sideways, Joseph's response was Jesus. God saves. As events unfolded over which he had little control, Joseph could personalize the words of the prophet, Emmanuel, 
God is with me. And when he would soon face such peril that he and his family would have to run for their lives, Joseph carried the gift in his arms. Jesus, God saves. Emmanuel, God goes with us. You see, Jesus came to empower and redeem. Jesus came to redeem and empower us to share his love to a world no matter what. And that verse, that very first Christmas reminds us of that fact that God can accomplish extraordinary things in your life and mine, despite our family, our circumstances, our situation, or our present reality. The first Christmas isn't just a cute story that we tell our children. It's a real story that gets retold again and again in our lives. And so when we wonder, why is this happening to me? Or why do I have, do I still have anything to offer anybody? Or how can I help in this situation because I don't feel equipped? We can remember Mary and Joseph's simple faith. Their trust in the midst of the suffering and the difficulty and being misunderstood. The truth that God was with them in miraculous ways and that he was up to something that was bigger than anything they could imagine. And I was struck by the fact that Mary and Joseph, who had to go through these difficulty things, were the exact perfect parents for Jesus, who was going to face being misunderstood, and he was going to have to walk through difficult and hard circumstances in his own life. And when he did it, he was going to remember his parents who modeled the very thing for him. You know, sometimes God delivers us from our difficult and our hard circumstances, but more often than not, he redeems them and he uses them so that our lives can bring hope to others. God uses common people to do uncommon things, and he uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things through his spirit as they listen to his leading. And if we listen and we hear his invitation, He takes the challenging, difficult, and seemingly impossible circumstances of our life and accomplishes things beyond what we can imagine. And I wonder if Mary and Joseph thought of the Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 words that I learned as a kid and words that I'm sure they knew well that simply said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding and he will show you which path you need to take. And then they had the reminder that whatever they faced, whatever they walked on that journey, that God would continue to be with them. And it's how that message that Matthew and his gospel wanted to remind us, because he starts with that in the beginning, and he ends his gospel with the words, and be sure of this, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. And that's Jesus speaking to us. You know, it's one of the things I love about this church is because it's made up of simple people who are continuing to trust God in the midst of challenging circumstances, trusting that God will show up, that he will redeem the hard and the difficult things. And then that story is retold in our lives over and over and over again. Now, if we want to enter into the Christmas story like Mary and Joseph, we have to start where we are by simply acknowledging our Christmas reality. There may be expectations that we need to let go of this Christmas season, or maybe we need to release a hard situation or invite God into it. Or maybe you're in a season that you're excited and Christmas has got new meaning for you. We all find ourselves in different places. But one of the things that we're going to invite you to do is basically write out your Christmas reality and pin it up to this one of these walls here so that someone from our prayer team or our staff can be praying for it this week. And you should have a card either on the seat next to you or the seat uh, sitting um, by you or in the seat uh, in the card rack in front of you. In your reality this Christmas, there may be a lot of expectations, either that you put on yourself or maybe from another family member, or maybe as you're anticipating Christmas and what the holidays bring, there may be difficult family relationships or maybe just too much family as you travel around. Or maybe it brings to mind somebody that you're missing. Maybe you've lost a spouse or a child over this past year and the holidays, I think, more than 
normal bring that home. And maybe you simply feel alone. Or maybe you're wrestling with God this Christmas season. Maybe you've experienced some hard things and you're wrestling with God. Or maybe the economy's hit you and you're not able to celebrate and do some of the things that you normally do. Or maybe Christmas for you this year is more hopeful. Maybe there's some new things in your life that you're celebrating. God's brought you into a new season or you just have a posture of thankfulness. But wherever you find yourself, my prayer and my hope for us this Christmas season is that we continue to see Jesus in Christmas. Because the truth is, it is the most wonderful time of the year, and not always because of our situation or because of our family. Sometimes it's in spite of those things. But it's the most wonderful time of the year because we have hope. And not a nameless hope. The hope we have has a name. Jesus, which means God saves. Would you pray with me? Father God, our, my prayer for us this Christmas is simply this. Help us to meet Jesus in the season with the traditions and the busyness. So much of it that points to you and some of it that pulls us away and distracts us. But I pray that you would meet us here. I pray that you would bring hope, that you would bring joy, that you would bring peace into our lives. And I pray that you would help us to share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen. is going to continue playing over these next few moments. We encourage you to take some time to sit with your present Christmas reality. And when you're ready, uh, if you're comfortable, make your way to one of the walls on either side of the stage. Pin that reality there where we can pray over it.
the hope of all creation, resting in his mother's arms. A song on the horizon, ringing through the heavens, the long-awaited Savior, come to set the captives free. set the captives free come set us free and hope has a name Emmanuel the light of the world who broke through the darkness all hail the king Emmanuel Started in a manger line that that promise for the word of God will never fail said leading up into the first Christmas is as true then to, as it is today or backwards it is today as it was then and so regardless of our reality hopefully that that today will bring a fresh new um, breath of wind to your soul to grab to that promise and take it through this season